Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is your boy, Jay Mace, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Album Cover, where you get the backstories from inside of the Vietnam music industry and give them their flowers while they're here. This podcast is very special because I have a good friend of mine who I've known for years, been rocking with him since the mid-2000s, since my days at UNCG. My brother from another mother, DJ B-Man. B-Man, what's going on, my brother? Jay Mason, what's going on, buddy? How you doing? Man, I'm doing good, man. I'm trying to do my intros like Sway, man, so that you can flex on them. You know, play it when you're about to do your drop or something, bro. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah, but on the real, I've been doing good, man. Of course, as you know, I'm out here in uh, the land of enchantment, or some would say entrapment, New Mexico, okay. you know, doing my thing out here and back in the wow. podcast game, bro. Wow, you back. You back, like you said, the janky promoters. Yeah, man, you got to come back. Absolutely. Yeah, I got to hit him with the Michael Jordan two-word fact. I'm back. That's right. That's right. That's all you need. Yeah, man. So um, with everything that's been going on with COVID, how has that been, you know, DJing live, virtual? and then with the clubs not being open like man how am I going to supplement all the money that that was lost because of COVID right so with COVID going on it's definitely been a little bit different and I'm still adjusting a lot of the gigs as you know are virtual it's just been different man I never thought we'd see the day where we'd be DJing over the internet and people would actually pay to hear you DJ over the internet so it's really different but it's convenient it almost spoiling me man it makes me not want to go out anymore. I know, right? You ain't got to deal with people sending you requests. You ain't got to deal with, if you know the end of 22 twos on Jay-Z's Reasonable Doubt, you ain't got to deal with that. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so turn that music down. I smell so reaper. I always, I always laugh when I hear that part, man, because you know that's how rough the club is. If the DJ got to cut the music down, talk over it, and when somebody goes to the exit, they ain't going to get their insurance. They're going to go get something else. That's right. That's right. That's your time to bounce. So for those out there that don't know, tell everybody how you got to start in DJing. Wow. Okay. So my story is a little bit different. Actually, I started at the age of five. I always had an interest for music. It was more so I didn't know what I was going to do with it. So I had a keyboard and all that stuff. Matter of fact, I just posted a picture, I think yesterday, of me playing on the keyboard at like four or five years old. And I had a cousin. His name was George. He's still alive today. Um, He actually used to DJ our family function so he will bring out a component set 25 and under if you don't know what a component set is that's like your family stereo they had a record player tape player and cd player and some speakers that weren't very loud but they would bring them out for cookouts and family functions so my cousin would bring his he lives in richmond we're from south boston virginia so we would meet in the middle and he would bring all his equipment down and i mean he had about 12 crates of records so he would bring it down every time so all the family functions he would be there he had a realistic mixer some big Belt driven turntables and you know my cousin you know I love him to death he loves to drink you know and he's a good guy I love my cousin George loves to drink and uh one night he got so twisted <laughs> we we're having a good time and he's just like I'm gonna let you play before that even happened he would tell me go get Snoop's gin and juice and I'd be like all right and go gin and juice and he's like wow this kid could barely talk and he knows album covers so I would associate Death Row with the man in the chair bad boy with the baby death jam was purple and certain things like that i just knew the logos and so me not even owning these records before i owned these records i knew what the label associated with the song was so he would tell me to go get a specific record i go get it and hand it to him so he was amazed by that then he taught me how to drop the needle so back in the day it was no taking it off the tone arm and just drop it it was literally take it off the tone arm and then it had a little ledge that you put down like a record player and then it would slowly go down and then it would start playing so once i learned how to do that that one night he got so twisted he was just like all right you go ahead and play so he had a cassette deck he had two dual cd players this is when they had the trays that go around and you could put five cds in a tray so he had two of those two cassette players and then he also had two turntables so i'll never forget i was playing rob bass it takes two he had doubles of it so when i say doubles he had two copies of the song and I put it on and 
I don't know if I was catching it correctly, but I kept it on beat. Like, I don't know if it was randomly in the song, but it was on beat. So my parents, family members were dancing. They were just, like, amazed. Like, that, who's playing the music? They look behind the turntables, and I'm barely seeing over the turntable playing the song and had some headphones on. And so they cheered me on, and that's where the love started, man. And so right there, you were probably trying to do an early iteration of that DJ JJ Jeff cut of I Want to Rock right now from I Want to Rock where he cut It Takes Two. Absolutely. Jazzy Jeff. Jazzy Jeff is definitely one of the reasons that I even DJ, man. Jazzy Jeff is my hero. My hero. I tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Right. So besides Jazzy Jeff, who are some of your other DJ influences? Oh, man. I like DJ Scrat, DJ Sinbad. That's a guy out in Norfolk, Virginia, who's my hero. DJ B. And that's a guy named DJ JC, who I, man, I used to take JC every day in Atlanta. I wasn't even in Atlanta, but I figured out a way to rig my computer up to tape him in, in like 2009, 2008 on B103. Mel Star. Mel Star is another one of my good friends, but definitely one of my heroes. There's so many great DJs, man, that I look up to. DJ Skills out of Charlotte, North Carolina, out of South Carolina originally. Another one of my heroes, man. Those guys, I'm glad to be able to call them friends now, but they're still my heroes. Right, because I was looking at a video on YouTube. It was years ago. It was at some party in Atlanta. It was DJ Nap. And then DJ JC came on the end in the way he was cutting Dance to the Drummer Beat by Herman Kelly in life. Yeah. I was like, oh my wow. God. Yeah, JC is an animal. And since you said DJ Nabs, absolutely Nabs. DJ Nabs, DJ Nabs break off the crisscross single, all right, is another reason why I'm DJing. I used to listen to that tape in and out. I can't forget Nabs. Nabs is definitely one of the reasons I DJ, for sure. Right. In the section of the yeah, where you're from, that's 434, right? That's 434. It, it used to be 804, but now it's 434, yes. Yeah. yeah, so I'm sure you're probably familiar with Lawrenceville and Emporia, Virginia, right? Heck yeah. Yeah, my neck of the woods, I'm like 10, 15 minutes away from Emporia because I'm right at the North Carolina Virginia. Line. That's crazy. Yes, I know Emporia. We go through there to go to Norfolk and all that. South Hill, all that area. Yes. Yeah, that's the home area right there. 252, 44 Emporia, Lawrenceville, Petersburg, Broad Nash, Chase City, that whole area. So how did you end up <laughs> in Greensboro? Okay, so, you know, I'm a little bit long winded, so I hope you got some time. Hey, we got time, bro. It's all you. <laughs> so my parents picked up and moved at, when I was 15. So we moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, and when we we moved to Greensboro, North Carolina. I, at the time, I was doing beats. You know, everybody goes through that phase where they think they're a rapper or a producer. Um, and actually, at the age of 15, we're in Greensboro. I used to sit in my room every day and produce. Well, a lot of people don't notice when I was 15 years old, I did a song for SAS and Dipset. I did a couple of songs with them. I did records with a mill Rockefeller record. I think she was off of Rockefeller at the time. I did songs with DOE, who was on Mosley Music Group, who was Timberland's artist. So I used to sit in my room. Oh, I did a record with DJ Webstar, who was hot at the time, and Young B, who did the Chicken Noodle Soup. I did a record for them. And these records that you can look up on YouTube, I'm kind of embarrassed of them now, but you can go back and look at them. But I was sitting in my room doing beat, and long story short, I finished high school. I graduated high school. My mother ended up getting in a terrible car wreck. My brother, my mom, my dad, they all moved back to Virginia due to my mom being disabled because she was an RN. So they moved back to Virginia. I'm kind of in limbo. This is my senior year. I went to Western Guilford High School in Greensboro, North Carolina. So I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do next. And my counselor at my school was like, you need to go to college. So I ended up going to school, giving school a run. I went to a and and I took up mass communication. So during that time, I was trying to figure it out because I was already doing radio within the school. I'm like, what's the next step? I ended up getting a gig at Lotus Lounge in Greensboro, North Carolina. And then I just stayed there for years. I stayed there for about five to six years. And then I just tried to take it to another level, man. That's really it. Right. And do you remember when you and I first met? Absolutely. That's when Section 8, DJ F, actually, DJ F brought me on first. I don't know how we initially met. I think he was doing gigs at Bennett College. And he asked me, yo, I got a radio show. Would you come on? And I'm like, heck yeah. At the time, I'm not really DJing like that. So this is when going live was it's super rare. So I came up with this thing. It was the website called Justin TV. This is before Facebook Live. This is before Periscope. So I was using Justin TV. Now at the same time while I'm using Justin TV, I'm DJing off the computer.
computer. I'm actually doing a live off the same computer, which is crazy because it was a Sony Vaio. And then I ended up moving to Livestream.com. That was the, the next level where it kind of changed the game, Livestream. And we met at the radio station because I was like, man, this guy knows a lot about music, a lot about remixes. And you know what? Your knowledge in remixes and New Jack Swing was just like crazy, man, like crazy. I would tell anybody, if anybody wants to refer to New Jack Swing or remixes, Jay Mace is your guy. And I'm not just saying that. Th- that's the truth. Man, yo, I appreciate that, man. But it's funny to think, you know, like yourself, me, Section A, F, Chris Lee. Big shout out to Chris doing his thing at WRL, yeah, yeah. Lee Sports Anchor, Show back Smooth. when he was known as Show Smooth. So it's just funny to see <laughs> how the artist for me known as Show Smooth. Yep, that's right. Uh, but it's good to see how all of us had that same meeting ground, and that was at WAG, man. That's right, that's right. Yeah, so did you ever get on at um, WNAA? WNAA, absolutely. I did radio shows there for years. Shout out to Dee Cherie. She's no longer with us, but she was instrumental in helping me with my career as well. Um, She gave you, me and my friend, VA Slim, a radio show. And I think we did that every Wednesday for a couple of years. Then I would have guest spots and just do mixes during the day up until about I would say 2017 and it was kind of an off and on thing but she really really helped me and I'll never forget her for that yeah I know the owner dynamics at NAA was a lot different from us at WAG where we were more free form while NAA it was definitely uh-huh. like a mix of urban adult contemporary and smooth jazz story format right you're talking about the WNA yeah WNA so how was that trying to get hip hop in when pretty <laughs> much their playlist was pretty much 97.1 one WQMG for those of you that don't know that's the Urban Adult Contemporary Station in the Greensboro Winston High Point Market. Absolutely. So at that time, man, I'll tell anybody, Mr. Wellborn, who's still there today, I believe, Mr. Wellborn was like the nicest but the hardest guy. He's like the Joe Clark of the radio station. And basically, it's whatever he says goes, which I, I totally get it. But I remember one time I was playing too many drops. Got a phone call. Yo, you playing too many drops. Da 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 da. So I'm like, okay, I need to cut back on the drop. Next week, you playing too many R&B records with rap verses in them. So I, now I got to play the R&B verses, cut around the rap, or play the no rap included versions. So I'm like, man, this dude is like listening every day. I send in a mix. Yeah, this had too much too much LL in it. We ain't gonna play it this week. We'll try it next week. But I love Mr. Wellborn because he definitely made me play around with my music. Like made me go around and made me not play the same records because most of the records we all know from the nineties have a rap verse in them or some type of rap break beat and he did not like that. So shout out to Mr. Wellborn. I really appreciate it. Right and for those of you not old enough to remember back in the day when they used to release singles they would have the regular version with the rap and the version without the rap and the one without the rap would be the one that urban AC stations would play because as they would say all grown all sexy and no rap but it sounded like you were getting calls like you were DJ Earn like you were doing too much <laughs> shout out to DJ Earn play some music Earn shout out to DJ Earn 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 <laughs> That that was the first thing that came to my mind when you said you're doing too many drops. Cause Earn is notorious for doing drop after drop after drop, man. But definitely shout out to DJ Earn. And did you ever find yourself associating with anybody at 102 during that time, like uh, Tap, Wally, anybody from the Wild Out? Absolutely. So during that time, after I started DJing on the radio, college radio, WNAA, I ended up DJing at this club called Lotus Lounge. The reason I got that gig is because at the time, like I said previously, I was going live on Justin TV. Now, at the time, I know that sounds crazy. Oh, you were just going live. But that, to my knowledge, it wasn't a lot of people going live. I hadn't seen anybody go live. As a matter of fact, the person who I got that from was this guy named DJ Just, who was Bow Wow's DJ. He used to go live like every day and just play joints. And I'm like, yo, that's dope. Like, we can see him right now and talk to him. So I started doing that. And that led me up to getting a gig at this club called Lotus Lounge, which was popular via, I would say, 2009 to about 2013, 14. And matter of fact, you said DJ Earn. Me and DJ Earn had the battle for the spot. So the funny story about that is the night of us battling for the position at the club, 
I had one of those big, you remember those bulky hard drives? They were called like a my book, but you had to power them. You had oh, to yeah. plug them into power source. Okay. So I'm in a club and I don't have a portable hard drive. I have one of those and you got to power it in. Now they had subs underneath the DJ booth. So <laughs> when I would play a record, you would see the hard drive down. So it's me and DJ Earn. He plays a set. I play a set. And they, they'll determine who gets the gig. Well, when I went on, I'm rocking. Everything's good. The bass hits so hard. My hard drive ejects from my computer, bounces off the ledge, hits the floor, and the music stops in the middle of the club. Um, and that was one of the most embarrassing times for me. But during that time, the reason... I got that gig. You said that I associate with anybody from the station. DJ MC of Greensboro, North Carolina, True School DJ, he was the one who really believed in me to give me a spot to let me open on Friday nights, Saturday nights. Man, I was, say, 19 years old, 18 years old, 19, somewhere around there, and I'm doing 25 and up night. I'm doing 21 and up night. He was sneaking me in the club to DJ and open up for him. Then it led up to a point where he would give me each and every Thursday, which was college night. So I was doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and that's all I did for four or five years, but... DJ MC of 102 Jams was definitely the person who helped me out in my career in the beginning stages. And also, Wally. Wally helped me out so much. Wally would let me come to the station, meet the artists. I have so many stories with artists that I've met because of Wally. Just an all-around great brother, man. Yeah, I was just did an interview not too long ago with Chris, and we were just talking about how Brian Douglas was able to spot talent and everybody that came through 102 gone on to do bigger and better. That's right. Right, that's right. You got what DJ Look Nasty, who's the artist himself, through Wally. You got Brandon D, who manages the Hamiltons. You got Rico Barino, who's writing songs for artists. Man, it's so much talent that came through Greensboro. So much, man. Yeah, cause so I was telling Chris that once I moved to Greensboro for college at UNCG. I mm-hmm. didn't know the hip hop history of the triad that was so strong and that. He beat, cut his teeth with the Busy Boys before he went on to do his thing with Original Flavor and Jay-Z. That's right. Man, there's so many people that came before. I didn't know the history. I was just like you. My brother K. Nice, man. And, you know, payroll records. People like that, like, that we never even heard of, but now we know the history. It's so much hip-hop history in Greensboro. Producers, DJs, man, k Nice, like I said, DJ Polo. The list goes on, brother. So many. Yeah, because I remember first moving to Greensboro, I remember my preset on the radio was always 102, 97.1. Those were the stations that I had locked in, and I can just remember seeing, uh, on a few occasions, 102 would come to our campus and maybe do, like, a little short remote here and there and everything and then once Chris started his ascension there with and turning for the while out you know I knew that it was going to be something big for him and then I was still doing my thing at the college station and originally they wanted to pre-screen my stuff because they're all about we're not commercial we're not commercial but once they saw okay you're getting this person this person this person that's when all that stuff <laughs> I bet <laughs> I bet, I bet, brother. Yeah, that's when all that stopped. But um, your embarrassing moment back at Lotus Lounge, that was not on video, was it? No, thank God it's not on video. I, I, was, I, was, not on I video. was about to say, thank God that it's not on video because I don't know if it's still on Earn's page or not, but he was at this nightclub. He was trying to do this routine with a potato. Uh, with and, the potatoes? <laughs> yo, yo, I swear, I laughed so, that video, and then the video was showed down, fell off the stage at the nightclub. Those are the two videos I laughed my butt off at. Yes. Those videos are classic. Matter of fact, I took on Earn all the time about that video. Yeah, I'm going to try to get Earn on the podcast, and I'm going to ask him, do you like potatoes, Earn? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, what I find kind of funny is that also our boy CJ, shout out to CJ, um, I got a chance to check him out in his show back in October. My wife and I went to Memphis, but we went to Pigeon Forest to check out the Motown review that he was in, and we was chopping it up and everything, and ironically, Mr. Rozzy was there, too. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, small world, man, but just to think about the 
from the beginnings and everything. Now, where was the point for you where you feel like, man, I got something here. I got the Lotus Lounge going. When was that moment for you where you feel like, okay, I need to take it to another level? Well, I stayed in Greensboro, like I said, for about five years. I would say I moved there in 2005. Actually, it was longer than that. It was to 2012. And I got there, and I just felt like I had did all that I could do. I was doing the clubs every, like I said, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, consistently for three or four years. And then I got to a point, I'm like, okay, I need to take this up a notch. Matter of fact, I moved to Miami, which was another story within itself. Um, I moved to Miami, and right before I moved to Miami, I got a phone call, a text from Jay Flex asking me that I want to be on one of two jams. I mean, literally two days before I was about to move. I didn't know that, bro. I didn't know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like two days or maybe the day of. It was like right there. And all my life, that's what I wanted to do was be on one of two jams. I looked up to all those guys, EJ Deluxe, you know, everybody. Sound Machine. Oh, my God, man. Sound Machine. DJ Polo, my hero. I looked up to all those guys. Horse Raining. And the day I was the move I want to say or two days before I got that text and I'm like ah. <laughs> I'm turning down 305 sunshine and public sandwiches to get on 102 <laughs> oh, yeah. hey yo don't, don't sleep on Publix Publix is delicious Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Those chicken scissors, boy. Yes, sir. My honest South Carolina. She stays right across the street from public. Every time we go visit her, mm-hmm. I would go get that. But it's interesting to see how everything works out and you wanting to get on 102. And it's such a well-known, well-respected station, not only in the Piedmont Triad area of North Carolina, but in the country because they're one of the few stations that still do live and local radio. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right, you're right about that. One thing I will say about 102 Jams is that they're great with breaking new records. They're not afraid. Like, they play street records. If it's popping on Instagram, they're going to play it. I remember them playing OJ the Juice Man record before they had clean versions. I mean, and they're playing them on the radio before they're popping. And then all of a sudden, you see other stations pick those same records up. So, shout out to Jay Flex. Shout out to Tap Money. Shout out to Brian Douglas for actually listening to the streets. Shout right. out to Big and, Mo, too. Yeah, shout out to Big Mo. And this was back in the days when radio had all the juice where when a record got broke on a big station, you knew you had a hit on your hands because other stations would start to get wind of it and they'll start to spread. That's right. So what do you think about the rise of North Carolina hip-hop? Because I felt for so long... North Carolina was either trying to follow what was going on down in Atlanta or up in New York. But mm-hmm. thanks to the rise of, like, Little Brother, then later on, J. Cole, Eurasity, and now with the baby, we're really starting to see North Carolina come to its own as a hip-hop hobby. I'm happy to see it, man. There's so much hidden talent, production, artists. There's so much talent here that people don't get to see. So it's it's good to finally see the light of day, like, these artists are being brought to the forefront. I'm happy to see it. I'm happy to see the baby. Matter of fact, I remember when the baby was in the clubs giving out CDs and flash drives and things like that just a couple of years ago. So it's crazy to see these artists. Matter of fact, Rhapsody, the club I was talking about, Lotus Lounge, I think the record is called As We Shine. You can look this record up on YouTube. I'm actually in the video. This was 2000, I want to say 9, 10? Ninth one to produce the record. Ninth one is in the video. And so it's just a beautiful thing to see the progression of these artists. Yeah, I definitely agree. And then I also heard from some people that the baby he went to UNCG all those a couple of years after I graduated, but I think he went to UNCG for a bit. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, he did. I did not know that. Yeah. So did you ever do the infamous rip shack? You know what? I did not do the rib shack. It's man, it's so many clubs. And, and strip clubs, I didn't get to do, but I hear about Sugar them. Bears. I always, nah, I, man, I was too young. I wanted to do Sugar Bears. I wanted to do Atlantis. I wanted to do Rib Shack. It was so many clubs that I didn't get. I didn't really get club club experience till probably, I would say, 2009. I was doing stuff here and there, but keep in mind, I was 18, like, literally fresh 
out of high school. So me going to the club to do stuff. If I did, it was in Virginia with my uncle. And it was kind of a let's sneak this guy in type of deal. But in North Carolina, I didn't really get that much club experience until 2008, 2009. Now, was there a difference in the nightclub experience in North Carolina than it is in Virginia? Or is it all one and the same? Um, I think it was all in the same. Man, honestly, I felt that Virginia was a little bit more racket at the time. I remember, man. What part of Virginia, though? (laughs) I'm from South Boston, Virginia. If you don't know where that is, I'm sure you don't. It is right, if you ever heard of Danville, it's literally 10 miles away from Danville, about two hours from Richmond. Richmond is probably our nearest landmark that people would know. So we're in the sticks, man. We're in the middle of nowhere. Not a lot there. It's a great place to raise a family, kids, uh, retire. But it's not a lot. It's not a lot. We have a Walmart. That's pretty much our mall. We have a seat and your fast food restaurant. And that's pretty much it. Everybody works uh, at a factory or pays to work in Danville or somewhere else. But it's not a lot of noise going on in South Boston. A little small, humble town. I love it to death. Matter of fact, I just came back yesterday. So when I was DJing in clubs, doing school parties, whatever you want to call it, um, at that time, I remember Little John, the whole crunk air, was big. It was a point in time you couldn't play nothing if you book. Like, that was like... A no, no. And that was the hottest record, but you could not play that record, especially not in Virginia because it would start some type of record. So, Yeah, and I also want to give a big mention because I think Memphis gets overlooked in the history of hip hop, DJ Spanish Fly and Three Six Mafia. Because when I went to Memphis, bro, I was in music heaven. Absolutely, they definitely get overlooked. Memphis has a lot of talent too, man. I mean, Three Six alone, bro, is crazy. Yeah, can't forget 8-Ball MJG. That's right. Yeah, man, so much talent, so much history out of there. I don't know. I think I might have told you. I went to Al Green's church when my wife and I was there. Oh, and he wow. Was, you got to yeah, go? we went to the church, right? So we went to Sunday school, did Sunday school, and then tour bus pulls up because a lot of international folks think it's the tour's trash. So they pull up. We were already sitting down, and lo and behold, Mr. Green in the flesh, in the pulpit. Gosh. Crazy, bro! That's I was crazy. trying my heart. I was trying my heart. not the fanboy in church. I was looking at him. I was like, I'm like, that's Al Green. That's Al Green. One lady, I guess she was from another country, doing offering. You know, how you go around the table and put your money in the plate. And he was asking people where they were from. So she tried to clean, smooth, slide him a program for him to sign. Oh wow! Did he? While in church, nah. He was trying to play it. I was like, oh, okay, I sign it later. But at least I had the decency to take my pictures before church started, and not in the church, you know, because I want to be respectful. Right, because right. if for those of you that don't know, growing up in the south, you go to work, you go to school, and you go to church in that order. That's right. And depending on how you were raised, you were in church more than just Sunday. That's right. Every day. <laughs> Every day of the week, usher meeting, revival meeting, BTW meeting. Baptism board, building fund committee, whatever committee, your aunt, your uncle, your mama, your grandma, if you were really raised in the church, church was like, you had to go to Walmart and get the clean edits of the rap. That's right. Why you say that, the clean edits, bro, my parents would not allow me to buy parental advisory CDs, and those things came in handy later on in my life. So I have the clean version of probably every hip-hop album that you can think of, right? And those come from my childhood because I would go to Walmart and get the clean version. My parents were not having that. And sometimes I would get the clean version, and you remember back in the day when they used to do the the back, what do you call it, the reverse? It wouldn't be like a, a instrumental part where they bleep out the word. They would have it reverse, and I guess the engineer would forget the bleep word. Oh, man, those No Limit CDs, my mom would clean take them. What? <laughs> man, that's crazy, man, because I was telling uh, my wife this, that when I was in seventh grade, I went on a school trip, and I remember walking to a Sam Goody, Again, not the CD, but the tape of the Slim Shady LP. No ID oh, wow. ass, no nothing. And everybody was looking at me like, oh, you got that new Eminem. Yeah. You got that new yeah. Eminem. Yo, Key, make me a copy. This was back when you had to get blank cassette tapes and actually record it onto the tape. But I didn't have that life where I was getting my stuff pre-screened. The closest I came to that was when I would go visit my dad in the summer in Newport News, and he was a minister. 
And I used to have to sneak oh, and watch B and T Soul Train and MTV because he wasn't allowed it. Oh, man. Yeah, so I made sure they had my hand on the last button on the remote real quick. Real quick. I can imagine. Yeah. That's, that's a different type of lifestyle. I thought yeah, I had yeah. that. You definitely had a bad. It was only with my dad, though. So um, you stated that you had a chance to go visit Future Studios in Virginia Beach, right? Yes. Yeah. Matter of fact, I was there the day it burned down. Matter of fact, at the time, this girl that I was dating, we went out there to just be tourists. I mean, I'm from Virginia, but I only went to Virginia Beach, I can remember, when I was little. So at this time, I'm going on a vacation, quote, unquote. I go out there, and I'm like, you know me, I'm a music head, so I'm like, future recording studios, I have to see it. So I got to go out there, and I think we went there the day before, and then the next day it burned down. And I have a picture of me standing out there, outside the studio, the day it burned down. Crazy. So what was it like for you being a VA native and seeing everything that was coming out of the Tidewater area with Teddy setting up shop there, then Missy, Timbaland, Neptunes, and everything that was just coming out of the 757. Man, it was surreal. I don't know if you know, but I am a huge Neptunes fan. Huge Neptunes fan. So when Super Thug came out, Up Jumps the Boogie, those records came out. I'm like, Timbaland? Timbaland's from Virginia? And then I found out we had the same last name and that we're possibly related. Man, it like, it's surreal. It's surreal, bro. Surreal. It, it just changed my whole mindset that you could possibly do something because, like I said, Virginia is one of those states. It's not a lot going on. You can't go there and be like, I'm going to this studio. I'm going to that studio. I know this person X, Y, and Z. It's very far in between. Matter of fact, um, the closest thing that we had to us that I would see this chick in Walmart, and it would bug me out because as a kid, I'm what? When this record came out, I was six years old, was Lady of Rage. She was from Farmville, Virginia. Now, if you know where South Boston is and Farmville, that's literally a 20, 30-minute ride. So to see her in Walmart, I'm like, yo, that's the chick that sings Afropuff. That's the chick off the Steve Harvey show. That's the chick off of next Friday. So to see these people in the flesh and they're really from Virginia, man, it just it changed my whole mindset, man. Yeah, because the closest that I had in my neck was the NC. I know you remember um, KP and Envy, right? Absolutely. Yeah, well, actually, it was Envy. She was from Weldon, which was about maybe 10, 15 minutes where I'm from. And I can remember when their record popped, she came to my middle school to perform. And she was saying, like, oh, I'm about to drop a solo album, but the solo album, I think, eventually got shelled. So that was the closest that we had to that. And then also later on, you know, once Terrence J exploded, because, you know, he grew up in Rocky Mountain, which is about 45 minutes from where I grew up in North Carolina. So to see him blow up, I was like, man. You know, somebody that's 45 minutes away is doing the big, and also Trey Songz being from Petersburg, which is about right. maybe 30, 45 minutes from where I grew up at NC. It was like all these people within a 30, 45 minute radius are all doing big things, and it gives you that motivation. Also, shout out to Chris Brown from uh, Tampa Hannah, Virginia. That's right. Man, when Chris and Trey exploded, that's when it was like, wow, you can really do this. It was an artist named Tyra who had a had a country girl. girl. Yes, Tyra. Man, it was so many people that blew up out of Virginia. I remember my aunt telling me that uh, she went to school with uh, what's, what's Shorty's name that was on uh, with Timberland, not Shanta. Uh, she was Miss on Make Ray? It Hot remix. Oh, Nicole Ray. On, not Nicole Ray, but the other one, um, Mocha. She went to school with Mocha. She was on the record Make It Hot with Nicole Ray. And I'm like, you go to school with her? And keep in mind, I'm a kid, so I'm just like, wow, that's crazy. You know her? So, yeah, it's so many artists. Joe Doja from Richmond, Virginia. Just so many greats, man. We can't forget D'Angelo, who's from Richmond. Yes, D'Angelo, hands down. Now, I'm a big Michael Jackson fan. I'm a big Neptunes fan. But D'Angelo is probably my favorite artist of all time. Voodoo is my favorite record. So I have a funny story about D'Angelo. Man, it's so crazy. Everything kind of happened at the same time. When I was about six years old, my cousin, my older cousin, my mom's cousin, lived in Richmond, Virginia. She used to work at this hotel. Now, from my understanding, I probably have to get the story straight. But D'Angelo's mom and my cousin were friends. From my understanding, they worked at the hotel together. 
So this is 94, 93. Now, I'm four, five years old. This is before he was on. D'Angelo, we would be at our house visiting from out of town because we're from Sobo. He lives in Richmond. D'Angelo himself and his mother would come over to my cousin's house. This is before Brown Sugar. So me seeing D'Angelo, D'Angelo would basically play with me in the other room. Pause. So literally, I, I would say a year or two afterwards, Brown Sugar comes out. I don't connect the dots So I'm about 19. I'm like, yo, that's D'Angelo. That's the guy who used to come over the house. And now I'm a huge fan. I haven't seen D'Angelo since, but I am a huge D'Angelo fan. Anything D'Angelo dropped, Voodoo is my favorite record of all time. All time. Right, because when I first heard Brown Sugar, it was like D'Angelo took what Prince was doing and just added a hip-hop flavor to it. That's right. That's pretty much what that, but I would be remiss if we did not mention Casey, JoJo, Dalvin, and Devontae, better known as Jodeci, and how when they came out, man, you know, being from North Carolina, knowing that they're from North Carolina, we were like, man, North Carolina's about to get on now. Yeah, another group that I'm big on is Jodeci. I'm a huge Jodeci fan. Like, Devontae Swing, man, so many greats have came from Devontae Swing. You got Genuine. You got Timberland. You got Missy. You got... uh player rest in peace static major player yep static major all these artists came from Devonte swing and then if you listen to the production i'm big on production that's the first thing i listen for when i listen to a record the things that he was doing at that time before it was software and all this stuff man he was so ahead of his time i didn't know they were from charlotte until years later Two years later yep right and then i didn't know until maybe a year or so oh, ago sweet that too, sweet too can't get a tweet. I didn't know until like a year or two later that um, Anthony Hamilton is related to Casey and Jojo. Yes. Matter of fact, he told me that. I didn't know that either. Him, he's related to, uh, if I remember straight, he's related to Rico Barino too. Fantasia. Yeah, yep. yeah, they, they're all related to um, the Barino, but I didn't know that Anthony Hamilton, he was originally signed to Uptown because I found on yes. YouTube a video that he did for a track that was produced by the Trackmasters for his Uptown album that got shelved. Yes. Anthony Hamilton was definitely on Uptown Records. Yeah. The album was called, like, Ecstasy, I want to say. Yeah, Ecstasy. I think it got shelved in R.I.P. Andre Harrell. I know BT, they're still going to move forward with their Uptown miniseries. And then at the end of this month, they're going to be airing a five-part docuseries on No Limit. And we definitely got to mention how Master P changed the industry for rap artists. It was unheard of to go in, get your deal, but keep your masters and most of the money. That's right. Nah, Master P changed the game, man, period. Cause you know what he was doing? He was giving double discs for the price of one. I remember when that hit and the, the covers were different. He was using like, uh, what was the artist's name? Ink and Pen or something like that? They were doing it like, super glossy with the bling on it and all this crazy stuff on the covers. And then he would have the plastic case. Instead of it being a jewel case like a traditional CD, he used plastic and it had little holes. Man, he changed the game, bro. Like, you got to respect that. Right. And then coming after him was Baby and Slim with Cash Money that gave us Turk, BG, Juvie, and the phenomenon known as Weezy F Baby, a.k.a. Lil Wayne. That's right. Right, so if you think about it, both of those labels coming from New Orleans, I would have been surprised that they probably never talked about, hey, man, we're both white hot, let's get together and let's do a tour. Yeah, I'm surprised that never happened either. Yeah, because during our era, you know, they were white hot, Rough Riders was hot, Bad Boy Diddy was hot. Now, shout out to Diddy. Diddy took what he learned from Audrey Herrera at Uptown when he got canned, took it over, Star bad boy, and he just shined it up a little bit and made hip hop more accessible with those familiar samples of him all in the videos, dancing, take that, take that, you know. So, what was your impact on Diddy's legacy in hip hop, what he brought to the industry with Bad Boy and reinventing the remix? Okay, so my history in music, I, as a kid, I used to sit around and listen and look at Video Soul with Donnie Simpson. Every time it came on, that and Soul Train every Saturday morning. I can't remember which day Video Soul came on, but I, I looked at it every time. 
So with that being said, I remember come and talk to me was the first thing that I noticed Diddy in. So I was like, man, that's the same beat as the EPMD record. So come and talk to me is one of those songs that changed my whole mindset on music. Jodeci album was the first album that I owned on cassette. The first album. I remember having that album going in Walmart and buying it when I was a kid. I had Jodeci, Forever My Lady, on cassette. And then Real Love came out. My aunt, my cousins used to bump Real Love. You remind me. So all that, man, Diddy, Diddy was another groundbreaker, bro. you got to get that man his props. So much history. So much history. So much history. And I think I read or saw somewhere that with the Kamatopsin remix, Diddy was saying now he just wanted to try to do what Ron G was doing with his blend tapes. Yeah. You know what? I looked at a couple of interviews with K. Capri. He said him and Ron G inspired what Diddy was doing, taking the hip-hop beats and putting them over R&B. Because if you look back, you got something in the way you make me feel over in Pizza President. And Pizza President is one of those famous drum breaks that's used on pretty much every song in hip-hop history, some type of way. So he literally took that format and just transferred it to his record, and it was a success. Yeah, because I was talking with various people and how with us being from the South, we always get stuff late. So the only way you would get stuff from New York would, would be if you had family or friends that would travel down and would bring it with you. Right, correct. I, when you say that, I remember hearing Hot 97 tapes, like people, friends of my aunts or whoever had tapes laying around coming from New York and Things like that. That, hearing Funk Master Flex on the radio, you remember this record called Nine? By, it was an artist named Nine. He had a Oh, what, what you want? That sample is Dr. the Bay by, o, by Otis Redding. Mm-hmm. Bingo. When I heard that record, I heard Funk Master Flex play that on the tape, and I remember him playing this record called Come On Baby with samples, Chub Rock, Treat Em Right. It was like a break record. Just hearing that, I hadn't heard that. I mean, those records probably had been out for months, but in, like you said, in the South, you don't hear that stuff until months later. It just, man. So many right. influences, bro. Right. And what was your thoughts on the rise of the South with what was going on in Houston with rap a lot, JD, So So Def, Dallas, Rowdy, and then everything that was cooking up in the dungeon with yeah. Goody Mob, Outkast, and everything? Well, at the time, man, when I was a, like, all this stuff, keep in mind, came out when I was about six years old, five years old. I didn't distinguish. The only coast that I could distinguish between was East Coast and West Coast. When I saw the East Coast, I thought of Dial's Effects. When I thought of West Coast, I thought of Snoop and Dre. That was when I was a kid. So Atlanta and LaFace and all that, I didn't realize it was the in-between part. You know what I mean? But LaFace records inspired me. I mean, L.A. and Babyface, I mean, just so much music. Equimini, Southern Playlist, the Cadillac, music. Hearing those records... Man, I mean, I had never heard 808s on records, so the South just inspired a whole, man, it just changed everything. Man. Hearing 808s on records, you didn't really hear 808s on records. You did, but they were subtle in the East Coast or the West Coast. I don't even think you heard of 808 at all unless it was like early <clears throat> NWA and stuff like that. But like hearing that 808, I'm like, yo. And you know, this was at a time when people had systems in their ride. That was like a big thing. So that took over the market, man. Like hearing those records, the 808. Right. Cause the ghetto I, boys. Right, man. The, my mind playing tricks on me, man. Great oh. record. Cause I was like nine when seven player listed came out and just thinking like, man, the South really has something to say. And I think that it was a tough sell for rap at the time because it was very East Coast, West Coast dominated where unless you were from L.A. or New York, you weren't getting major plays. So I think that first Outkast album was a hard sell. But once I saw the Art of Organized Noise documentary, I didn't know this, that Diddy directed the video for Players Ball. I didn't know that either until I seen that. You're right. Yeah. And, and, and piggybacking off of what you said, you said my mind's playing tricks on me. There's two records that I, like, off top, when I think of 1992, it's just automatic. Well, actually, three. It takes me there. They want effects by Daz Effects, one of my favorite hip-hop videos, one of my favorite hip-hop records of all time. Um, also, my mind's playing tricks on me. Now, just to put you in a mindset, my dad is a cop. <laughs> And a deacon. 
And in 1992, I remember this day like it was yesterday. I remember him working out in his garage. He had on a Nike sweatsuit, and he's playing. My mind's playing tricks on me. Now, this is a guy who goes to church every Sunday. And at the time, hip-hop is crazy. You got Rap City every day, and my dad's a deacon and a cop. And he's playing. My mind's playing tricks on me. So that's one of the songs that definitely just sticks out in my heart, man. Like, every time I hear that record, it automatically takes me back to his garage. Love yeah, that record. Yeah, love that record. R.I.P. Bushwick Bill. That's I don't right. know if you know, but um, Sleepy Brown's dad was in the funk band Brick. Did not know that. Yeah, his dad was in Brick. Brick. They did um, Ain't Gonna Hurt Nobody. And I think he had owned a studio down in Atlanta. And then CeeLo and all those guys were talking about how they would sit outside what was at the time Boss Town Studios, which was Bobby Brown. By, of course, Bobby Brown, which later turned into Stankonia Studios, and was just thinking like, man, want to get in there, want to record. So to see Atlanta take off, you know, like I said, for me being from the South, it's like, man, we are finally getting paid attention to. And then I was even more happy once, T.I. sophomore album exploded because I felt I'm serious was a great album, but it was just a little bit too southern in its content to appeal to any areas outside of the South. Right, no, I agree. I'm with you there. Yeah, because it was the first time where people were talking about, you know, the trap and then, you know, with the reinvention of yourself, we could talk about Two Chains because originally he was known as T-Boy in Player Circle and then he ended up reinventing himself, you know, becoming Two Chains, having more success. Now, how did you come up with without no DJ? Okay. Um, so, you know, when I was DJ, my name originally was DJ B. Of course, that's a simple name. So I went through so B Master Flex because I wanted to be like Funk Master Flex, which is a terrible name. And then it became DJ D Man. My grandmother coined the term, I would say, it's a mixture between my grandmother and my cousin Jamal. My cousin Jamal used to call me B Man when I was little. He just randomly started calling me B Man. And my grandma, when I was younger, used to call me Main. So I'm like, B Man, Main, it's meant to be B Man. So I originally started out as DJ B Man. And then it became a point to where I'm like, hey, why do I got to title myself a DJ? You know, at some point, there was a bunch of rappers who called themselves MC such and such. MC Light, MC Search, MC Hammer. And then it became a cool point to drop the MC off their name. And I'm like, everybody knows what I do. Why do I got to say I'm a DJ? Why do you got to say you're a chef if people know you cook? So I dropped the DJ off of my name, and I would be at that club, Lotus, and they would have celebrities come through. And they would be like, what do you want me to say on the mic? It's a name. I say, say, just be man, no DJ. So they would get on the mic, and they'd be like, just be man, no DJ. I'm like, no, just say B-Man without no DJ. Just B-Man, no DJ. I'm like, bruh. So then I looked at cats like Soldier Boy Telling, and it was kind of the same thing. It was really Soldier Boy, but he used the whole term Soldier Boy Telling, and that's how I got money. Okay, yeah, in- interesting story. And now I'm thinking back to the first time that I heard this producer. Mm-hmm. Out of Shy Town. It was right. off this mixtape, the Dream Team. Mm-hmm. My friend right. got it to me via CD Burn. Champions. Okay. I played Champions back to back to back because I was intrigued that somebody would sample Queen. Now, what was it like for you the first time you heard a Kanye oh. West production? Bro, this this is going to sound crazy, and it's probably going to sound like an unrealistic answer. So I am a huge Kanye West fan up till, I would say, the Yeezus album. I'm a huge Kanye fan. Matter of fact, Late Registration is probably my third favorite album of all time. So the first record I heard, it was in eighth grade. I remember exactly where I was. The bell was about to ring to go home to get on the bus, and my friend, his name is Tavon Dawes. He had a, a hot night. 97 mixtape. No, no, was it a Hot 97? Maybe it was like a DJ Clue tape or something. It was something from New York. It was like a bootleg tape. And he played this record called Champions. He was like, listen to this. And I listened to it, and I'm like, wait, it felt like the chipmunk. 
and I heard the drums over this chipmunk beat. I'm like, bro, this is crazy. Like, who who did this beat? And I remember nobody at the time knew who it was. And I remember this guy rapping. And at the beginning of the verse, if you listen, he said, I bet you they didn't know that, that you produced. He said, I bet they didn't. And then he goes into the verse. I, bro, I looked for that track, I would say, for five months until I found it. I remember going to Willie Cities and Tapes. And the guy playing it live while I was in there. And I said, yo, can I get two copies of that record? He said, I literally just sold it to the guy that just walked out. That's how hot that record was. It wasn't even on radio. It was just like a street record. But the beat was so hard. That was the first time I heard Kanye. And I became a fan ever since. Like, I was obsessed with Kanye. I just knew I was Kanye. There's a video of Kanye. He was in the studio, I think, cutting a Shirley Murdoch sample, putting it in the Insonic keyboard, and the track ended up going to Do or Die, but just to see his production, how far ahead he was with his samples of soul records and the loops, it was just like, man, this guy is going to be something. Now, I will also be remiss if we did not discuss real quickly about the influence of Go-Go, because, you know, you being from VA, me being from NC, Go-Go gets a lot of play in North Carolina because of the close proximity to D.C. Yeah, absolutely. So, Go-Go in Virginia was everything. And I think sometimes even me DJing out, I got to remember that not everybody knows Go-Go. Like, North Carolina got a taste of it, but we got a little bit more taste of it because we were closer to D.C. So, DJ Pool was my first taste of Go-Go. I remember hearing I got that feeling. No, even before I got that feeling, it was a 20-minute workout. The uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, that was the first record that I heard. And then there was another artist who doesn't get a lot of shine, but he was semi-go-go. He was from Virginia. His name was Sam the Beast. He had a record, and I remember my cousins used to play that. Like I said, my cousins are from northern Virginia more than I am, so they would play me these records and these tapes that they had. Then my cousin put me on older go-go, which was like Trouble Funk. I heard Don't Touch That Stereo by Trouble Funk, and then it went to Rare Essence. Then it went to Junkyard Band, and then Huckabuck, and it just continues on from there. So go-go is everything to me. Matter of fact, they just did a documentary with one of my friends who produced some of the go-go on the documentary, Tone P, the best kept secret, who did a lot of Wale stuff. Yeah, man, go-go, definitely a huge influence. I didn't notice until a couple of years ago that Chuck Brown, he was born in my neck of the woods in North Carolina, North Hampton County, before he yeah, moved to get raised in D.C. And, you know, once Nelly sampled Bustin' Loose for Hot in Here, that was all she wrote. That's right. Yeah, because I can remember, man, like I was saying, with my area being like four hours from D.C., hearing, you know, mm-hmm. EU, Rare Essence, Trouble Funk, Chuck Brown, DJ Flex, and then the Baltimore Club mm-hmm. music that was coming out of Baltimore because, you know, a lot of people from that way you got family down south, so they would bring that stuff with them. And That's I right. felt North Carolina was always a good mix because we had people from all over going to the HBCUs down here because I think Dive Effects, they both went to Virginia State in Petersburg, uh, Do It All, and I think Mr. Funky and Lord Jazz from Lords of the Underground, they all went to Central, North Carolina Central. Okay. So it seemed like North Carolina always had that feel of, okay, this is what's going on here. This is what's going on here. I'm going to come down here to go to school or do whatever. Now I'm going to take what's popular in my way with me. And the thing with Teddy opening up Future Studios in Virginia Beach, just to think about how revolutionary what he was doing, taking hip-hop, R&B, merging it together. Because when you listen to Keith Sweat's Make It Last Forever album, it was like, R&B is not your grandparents or your parents' R&B anymore. Right. Bingo. Bingo. Right. And with Devontae, Devontae Swing, he was under the speed of I'll Be Sure. And shout out to Kyle West. Kyle West does not get enough mention yes. for his con- his production. I'll I mean, Be the stu- Sure, yes. I, I mean, the stuff <laughs> they did with Kevin, alone yes. with you, alone. Yes. Alone yep. with you, alone. I mean, the bass, I mean, their production is unlike no other. And before I get y'all out of here, uh, do you have any interviews coming up on the Without No DJ podcast? Or uh, is that still in the works? 
Yeah, so if you haven't checked out uh, Without No DJ Podcast, it's a podcast which me and my friend, Claude Whitfield, who owns With These Hands DJ Academy, we came together and put together this podcast that basically focuses on the stories of the DJs. We have DJ JC, DJ Shock Kim, who's BDD DJ, like I said, DJ JC, Ludacris, former DJ. We have Rob Swift and Mr. Sinister of The Executioners, DJ Skills, who is Dougie Fresh's DJ. And we have Mel Star, who's Albie Shore, Houdini, and uh, CL Smooth DJ. So that's what we have so far. And what we have coming up, as soon as this COVID mess clears, hopefully soon, we're shooting for soon, we're going to have DJ Just, who's Bow Wow DJ. He was on a Showtime at the Apollo. Definitely inspired me. He's going to be on a podcast. Hopefully, we'll get DJ Lonnie B of the Heavy Hitters out of Virginia. Hopefully, Mad Skills, and just a host of others, man. We just keeping it moving yeah definitely that and where can people go find it you can go on youtube go to youtube.com backslash without w-i-t-h-o-u-t no n-o-d-j podcast or you can just type in without no dj podcast separate together it doesn't matter it'll come up and with these hands is it open to novice anybody want to get in the game learn how to dj or absolutely how does that work yeah if you don't have any knowledge in djing and you just love music and you know this is what you want to do as long as you take it serious we're there for you you want to get your hands right you want to learn how to dj you want to learn the history it doesn't matter we can teach you whatever you want to learn um scratching mixing blending beat matching all that you come to us we'll get you right yeah next time i'm in the 704 i definitely have to have to drop this so i can scratch and do a bunch of drops and play the reggae air horn about a million times <laughs> that's right that's right that's what we need <laughs> yeah so I, so I can dj my next what's christmas party and they believe me like uh what is a uh, what is a buju bonton <laughs> what is a a, a, a shabu a shabu rank because man I was in the Bahamas, right, about a couple years ago. My wife and I, we went on our honeymoon cruise, and we were going back wow. to the ship, and we had to take this car, and the radio was on, and the alternate version of Mad Cobra Flex came on. Dog. Okay. I was trying my hardest not to be so black on that car, man, because there were some other folks that didn't, didn't know what was going on, right? So I was look, I was like, oh, snap. And then my wife looked at me like, what are you be doing? I'm like, man, that's Mad Cobra. She was like, uh, I don't know who that is, but I said, that to say, man, like reggae has like a special place in a DJ set depending on where you're at. And did you catch Fabulous and Jada Kids on um, versus Battle? You know what, man? I didn't catch it live. I caught it. I went and YouTube it afterwards because I just simply forgot. Not that I didn't want to watch it. I just I forgot about it. And man, yeah, I watched it afterwards. I've seen it afterwards. Right? <laughs> yeah, I YouTubed it too because I think it was two different lanes. Jada won because Jada he had more of the street stuff. While Fabulous, he's the go-to guy if you need a rap verse on the R&B hook. Right. He's the go-to guy for that. And then I want to get you out of here on this. Okay. Did set does not get talked about enough. Their run, early 2000s. I mean, if you saw the BET Awards recently, Amanda Stills spoofed Cameron wearing pink when he was in Rap City's The Basement. Yes. All right, so we want to talk about Dipset. I know I sound like a bandwagon on everything because I'm like, me too. Dipset, when I was in high school, was everything. Diplomatic immunity, I own four copies of the CD. I own four copies. I am a huge Cameron. I don't really listen to them as much now. I listen to their older stuff. But Purple Haze, Come Home With Me, um, all of Jim Jones, From Me To You, Joel Santana, all that stuff. Man, that is the soundtrack to my high school years. I remember wearing pink long tees. I remember back in the day, you'd go to Foot Locker and get these long tees for $5. Me and my whole crew wore pink, pink headbands, pink shoes. You know, it was ridiculous. Pink do-rags. So, Diplomats to me was everything. I'm talking about everything. Yeah, man. Everything. Cameron had me on the SDE album for Horse and Carriage, but what really sold me on him was the remix with Phil the Shocker, Bit Pun. Charlie Baltimore, Y Club's in the video, and it had me because they flipped the theme song for Night Court. 
Wow. Okay. I yeah. don't necessarily remember that record, but I remember my aunt used to play horse and carriage off the FDE out. No, Confessions of Fire. Oh, Confessions of Fire. Yeah. yeah. That's what I remember. I didn't catch someone to Cameron and really start appreciating his music until the case late mixtape and then the diplomatic community come home with me. That's when I really got on Cameron. Let me know and all that stuff. That's a little bit before my time before I actually started appreciating. So yeah, yep. yeah. And to quote his role as Rico from Payton Fool, no ribs, no soy sauce, no champagne. You get nothing. What's poppin', crummy? That's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah man, so any shout outs you want to give before we close? Shout out to you for even taking the time to interview little old me. And I just appreciate that now. I really do. Shout out to everybody who I mentioned, the people I didn't mention, all the DJs who inspired me, Polo, Mel Star, DJ Skills, DJ B, DJ Nav, DJ JC, all my fellow DJ friends, everybody in Charlotte, everybody in South Boston, Virginia. Thanks to everybody who took the time out to ever book me in life, listen to a mix. I just appreciate everybody. And how can people get a hold of you on social media? My tag is at just, J-U-S-T, B as in boy, man, M-A-N, no DJ. So just be man, no DJ on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Podomatic, Mixcloud, Twitter, all that good stuff. In the words of Stephen Jackson for all the smoke, all of them. <laughs> now, man, um, you no, know, it's always been my pleasure, man. You and me, we've been rocking since my UNCG days. And from one friend to another, man, I'm just so proud of you. You know, DJing and outside of DJing, what you become, bro, and anything that you Thank need you, that brother. I can do. You know, all you gotta do is just say the word, and you got it. Same here, bro. Anything you need, man, holler at me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Beyond the Album Cover podcast with my homie, my good friend, B-Man. B-Man, thank you for doing this interview. Thank you so much, man.